Morning, folks. While I wait for uh, parts to come in for the Sansui 9090DB I'm doing a restoration on, I've got this NAD. This is a 7175PE. A friend of mine gave this to me to look at. Um, says it powers up, no sound. So we're going to take a look at that, see what the symptoms are. But uh, for anyone who is new to this channel, first off, please subscribe. Cost you nothing, helps me out. And with that little bit of unpleasantness out of the way, I want to let you know that I am a fan of the short form video. And while a lot of my favorite YouTubers do videos that are much longer in length, I know we all lead busy lives. I like to keep them half hour or less whenever possible. But I want to assure you that I am not fixing these things in a half an hour or less. It takes hours and occasionally days to figure out what the problem is. So I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea. I've said this before, but like I said, if you're new, you may not have heard me say this. So I want to make sure you understand that. There's a lot of things I do off camera, um, a lot of blind alleys I go up. I try to talk about them so nobody else will follow me down the wrong path. Um, but like I said, I like a shorter video. We all have very busy lives. So we're gonna take a look at this, see what it's doing or not doing, as I'm fond of saying, and uh, take it from there. Okay, so this unit does power up and I am feeding a signal into the CD inputs. This doesn't have auxiliary, but CD is a line level input, which is equivalent to auxiliary. So we're feeding a signal into there. And for those of you, again, who are new here, who not, may not be familiar with what I have set up here, I have a Panasonic Levere 7725 distortion analyzer and my oscilloscope, which is being fed from the back of that. So we take the signal from the distortion analyzer out here into the unit under test. And then from there, we look at the dummy loads that the amplifier outputs are plugged into, which are going in here and also feeding the oscilloscope. So we have a signal going in right now. And if I turn the volume up, we get absolutely nothing on here. So my friend spoke truth. There is no output. So we're gonna take a look at the back of this thing, see what our options are. Okay, so here we are looking at the back and I'm finding exactly what I wanted to see. I'm gonna kill the power. But what we have here is we have the old pre-out main in jumpers. And the great thing about these is it allows us to divide the amplifier, this is an integrated amplifier, into the preamp section and the power amp section. So what we're going to do now is we're going to pull the pre-main jumpers out like that. And we're just going to feed a signal directly into the power amp and see if we get anything on our analyzer. So now that I've done that, let me get you so you can see that and we'll put some signal in and see what happens. Okay, I'm going to turn this back on. Now we don't hear this click out of protection and when we we're going directly into the main power amp, the front controls, the controls on the front have no effect with the exception of, of course, your speaker selector. So we have nothing coming out of this amplifier. So what we're going to do is we're going to back up and we're going to feed a signal back into the CD, but we're going to take a look at the preamp outputs. And that'll let us know if we have a problem in the preamp. Uh, right now it looks like the power amp's the trouble, but we need to verify what's going on because the whole thing may be dead. We don't know yet. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we are going to take our signal, move it back from the pre and go back into CD. Then, we're gonna come out of our pre. And from our pre-out, I have these adapters on here to go to BNC. We need to go to the input of the distortion analyzer. So we're gonna turn this, put these on here. And now instead of coming out of our dummy loads, we're coming out of the preamp output on the integrated amplifier. So now let's test it and see what we get. 
Okay, so I've got this thing turned around now to where I can get to the volume control. And when I turn the volume up, we have good signal. Now, we don't pay attention what the wattage is because we're coming out of the preamp now. I could set it to voltage and we could see if we get uh, however many volts out of here. But, let's turn the amplitude up on the distortion analyzer. So you can see we have good output from the preamp, no output from the amplifier. So we know our trouble's in the output stage. So we're gonna pop the cover off. I'm gonna show you an easy way to figure out which channel it is because 99 times out of 100, it's one channel and not the other. All right, so I'm gonna go into the bottom of this guy and see what's going on. Uh, again, if you're new to my channel, I always make a bag. I'm fortunate I work in the telecom industry and we get bags like this that are in the trash all the time. Uh, we get a single fiber jumper in here. We take the jumper out, we run it, bag winds up in the trash. Or my favorite is when the installers come in and they may put in 60, 80, 100 jumpers, all these Ziploc bags go in the trash. So I take them right back out of the trash, bring them home, and I'll put a label on here and I'll label it with the piece of equipment and inside this larger bag, smaller bags go with all the hardware. And they'll, they'll be marked where they go. I tend to have several things taken apart while I'm waiting for a parts order to arrive. So this helps keep things organized. Um, some of you may be able to remember all this stuff and there was a day I could as well. Sadly, that day is long gone. The other thing I do is on the inside of a cover, I will write what it is in pencil so it can be erased easily but should the bottom get separated from the rest of the unit I'll know where it goes so this is just an easy way to keep yourself out of trouble I just wanted to point that out so now these are all the output transistors and chances are one of them is going to have a crazy amount of DC on it so that's what we need to determine as I kick the camera. And no, I'm not tripping over a cat as I usually am. So, we take a ground clip. And that's gonna go to the negative input of my meter. Let's see, I want everyone to be able to see the readings we get here. Okay, that should be good. And now for the positive input, I have my meter with this extension probe on it. I bought the cheap ones, but what I discovered is they, they're a little too flexible. These are the genuine fluke ones. They cost about five times as much. And they say they're only rated for 60 volts. I find that kind of hard to believe, but they don't bend as easily. And like so many things in life, you get what you pay for. So what we're going to do is we're just gonna take a look in each channel at one of the emitters. Um, I often tap off for emitter resistors. They're probably on the other side, but here we are. This is easy enough to get to, and this should point out where our problem is. So I'm gonna apply power now. And remember, if you're doing this at home, you're doing so at your own risk. I show you what I'm doing. Should you decide to do this yourself, I cannot be responsible. That's the standard disclaimer. Okay, so we've got this powered up. And I'm gonna look at an emitter. And we got 84 volts on this emitter. Let's see that. I don't know for sure what that guy is, but it sure looks like one of the outputs. But it may not be. I don't have the schematic in front of me. So let's look at the other channel. Yeah, I think this is where our problem is because our emitters here are at negative 80 volts. Oh yeah, we definitely have a problem on this channel. I'm gonna have to look at the schematic and see what this transistor is doing. 
it's been replaced because if you look at the form factor, this is a much physically larger transistor than any of the others in here. But these should be our outputs. This is probably our bias transistor here. But if you look at our emitters, and I'm not sure if you can still see this. Okay, that looks good. This channel is okay. Our emitters are putting out virtually nothing, which is what you want. But when we look at the other channel, we have negative 80 volts. So I'm gonna turn it off and we're gonna just do a quick and dirty short test. And I think we're gonna see we have shorts over on this channel. Power's off. Okay, so this is the schematic of one channel on the NAD. I'm just gonna go over it real quick and hit the high points here. This is what they could call a triple Darlington output stage. If you recall when we talked about Darlingtons, the collectors are tied together and the emitter feeds the base of the next one. These are parallel, these are the outputs and this would be the drivers, okay? These dotted lines going around here indicate that they are screwed to the heatsink assembly. So these are all screwed to the heatsink assembly as well as these. Now, when I was taking voltage readings, I determined these were not part of the outputs and they are not. I believe, although I'm not sure, that these are part of the NAD power envelope, which should vary the DC voltage going to the output stage. So we go back to here and this other transistor here with a dotted line around it is our driver. It's the small one that was in between the outputs on the heatsink. And we got some interesting readings. We were reading uh, negative 79 volts pretty much on the emitters of uh, all four outputs. So I went back and I looked at the bias transistor here. And you know what? It also had about negative 78 to negative 79 volts on all its terminals, yet none of these transistors were shorted. So, usually what this means is we have a problem, either a short here dumping too much negative voltage up this way, or something open up here, not allowing positive voltage to go this way. Because remember, an output stage is a balancing act between your positive rail and your negative voltage rail. And at the output here, after the emitter resistors, we should have net zero voltage. Each one of these uh, emitter base junctions will drop 0.6 volts. So we should have 0.6 volts here and then at the junction here, we should have 1.2 volts. And then if we go here, we should have 1.8 volts. So I should have positive 1.8 here, negative 1.8 here. And that's what we should see when we look at the emitter and collector here, because that's what feeds the drivers. So I had negative 79 volts all the way around and this guy wasn't shorted either so what i like to do when i'm trying to troubleshoot something like this and it's fortunate that stereos have two channels because we have a good one and a bad one so i take the voltages from the good channel and i write them on the schematic in blue then i take the voltage from the bad channel and i write them in red and this way you can kind of get an idea of what's going on. I used to write them on a separate piece of paper, but this I find easier to work with and easier to, to diagnose. So the good channel on the base here had negative 0.98 volts. The emitter had negative 1.6 volts and the collector had positive 1.6 volts. You can see we had pretty much negative 79 all the way around. And what I found that I said I found surprising was sure enough, we didn't have our DC coming down here because we have a bad pot. Now you remember we had a bad trimmer in the Sansui I was working on and we had a bad trimmer here. And I'm gonna show you what it looks like I can find it in this mess of a bench I have here. It's 
a very small trimmer resistor. Let me put in the pair of hemostats so you can see it. And the reason I find this so unusual is normally you don't have bad trimmers. Only if you have a catastrophic failure in an output stage that cascades back this way and takes out your bias transistor, dumps a bunch of DC and burns open your bias spot. Well, this is not the bias spot. This is something weird that NAD is doing. We have our offset pot here. We have our bias pot here, pretty much where you'd expect to find it. And then you got this guy here, which they say is used to dial in, dial down distortion. It's gonna be crossover distortion. And basically what they want you to do is they want you to put in 20 kilohertz, set the output under no load to put out three volts AC and then dial for minimum distortion. So we'll take a look at that after we um, get it back up here. I just wanna go over what we found. And this is that little trimmer right here. Now this guy is supposed to be 200 ohms and I'm gonna put a meter up here. All right, these will work. Here's our meter. Okay, so I'm gonna turn this so we can see that. This is our pot. It's reading yeah, about 27, 28K ohms. It's supposed to be 200 ohms. Don't know what happened to it. This was the whole problem. Once I replaced that, everything started to work. Now I had to dial it in um, and I didn't, realize what was wrong at first and i have to tell you this because these are pitfalls that happen to everyone when they're distracted or not paying attention both which i am guilty of from time to time but if you recall I'll tell you what, i'm going to pause this because i'd like to show you what's going on so i'm going to pause the camera we're going to move this and you'll get a better idea what i mean so if you recall, I had taken the dummy loads off so we could feed the preamp in to see if the preamp was working. And once I determined the preamp was good, I disconnected the cables from there and began to troubleshoot the amplifier. Once I found that pot was open, I put it on, back on the analyzer and I knew I had output because I could see I was watching the bias and whenever you feed a sine wave into an amplifier and you're measuring the bias across the emitter resistors, you'll see the DC average value will climb. So I knew I had output, but I wouldn't see anything on the analyzer. And finally, I went through the scope probe and I checked at the relay, which I could hear clicking in, and then at the speaker selector switch. And finally, I went all the way down here and looked at the backs of the speakers output and the scope probe said hey you got output and let me tell you what happened i forgot to plug my dummy loads back in so lesson learned you have to pay attention that cost me a little bit of time couldn't figure out what was wrong fortunately it was only a few minutes but it's one of those things that i find really annoying about myself just wanted to share that now, in order to get down into this, remember this is a receiver, so I had to loosen and lift the tuner board. I didn't unwire anything, but in order to be able to safely fire it up, I keep all kinds of different sizes and shapes of cardboard on the bench or under the bench. I also have pieces of short pieces of one by two, um, two by fours, like I said, I keep cardboard of all different pieces, shapes, and that's why. Because a lot of times you have to take things apart. I want to be able to fire them up safely. So this is what we do. At least this is what I do. So I am feeding into the output stage. We know the preamp was good, so I'm going to turn the noise makers on since you can hear the air conditioner um, air handler is running. So I'm going to put this on. Okay, 
Now I'm going to move in just a little closer so you can read the analyzer. Zoom in a little bit. Okay, so let's put some power on. Okay, I heard it pop out of protection. We have signal. That little pot was a whole problem. This guy right here. I mean, how crazy is that? It was a very small pot, and if you recall, where it was in the circuit, and there's probably an appreciable amount of current going through there. So I replaced it with a Borns, and I'm gonna turn this off and show you where I put it and why I put it where I put it. So I'm gonna stand this guy up so we can look at the bottom. Okay, so looking at the bottom here, this is where I put the pot because the only way to get to it before was to remove the tuner board. They have small holes in here, here, and here where you can access the offset and bias pots. But the only way to get to this guy was to remove that board. I didn't want to have to do that. So I soldered this little Borns pot under here. Now this board is recessed enough to where the cover shouldn't be a problem. And that way I can get to all three pots without having to remove that tuner board. I did a rough, uh, quick and dirty set of the bias and the offset just so it would come out of protection, but I need to let it warm up and go through the whole process. And we're gonna do that. I just wanna show you how to set that, um, that pot already placed and then we will uh, call this one done. It belongs to a buddy of mine. He came by here with a problem he was having with a, with a two preamp. Um, and he left this here. He said he got it from a guy, as I said. Power's up, doesn't work. This pot was the whole problem. Unbelievable. Two in a row. Doesn't usually happen like that. Okay, so I've got meter hooked up. I have this meter hooked up just to the speaker output. So this is our offset. This meter here is going to be our bias. The bias test points are not available with the tuner board in. So I just simply went across the emitter of one of the PNPs, one of the NPNs. You want to make sure that they are the same pair. It's easy enough to just connect it, look at your own meter, see that you're in the right place. So we're showing a bias of 13 millivolts, offset of 10 millivolts. Specs call for bias of 20 to 25 millivolts, offset of zero plus or minus 50 millivolts, which is quite a bit of a leeway there. So we should be able to make that easily. Now you can access all three pots on this channel now since I put this one here. This is our bias. So we're gonna turn that up till we get about 20. The amplifier's been on for a while. You're supposed to leave an amplifier on three to five minutes before you make these adjustments. They are temperature sensitive. You want the amplifier to come up to temperature. We don't think of things that are solid state as having a warm up time, but they definitely do. And our offset is well within spec, but we're here. It's a pretty easy one to dial in. Compared to the Sansui's, they're extremely touchy. Okay, so here we are. We are at pretty much zero millivolts, one millivolt. It's going to drift around, okay? But this is looking good. So what we want to do now is we want to do the adjustment of this pot since it was replaced. I believe it is basically a symmetry pot. They want us to set it to three volts AC at 20 kilohertz. I can assure you, neither one of these meters is going to be accurate at that frequency. But just for grids here, I'm going to put in a signal at 20 kilohertz. 
And then we're going to compare it to my Keithley bench meter, the one up here, because this is good to 100 kilohertz AC. You need to know your test equipment's attributes and limitations. So I'm going to set the analyzer to put out 20 kilohertz. And we're going to try, let's see, I'm going into the output, so I'm going to see what we get right here. All right, that says 28 millivolts. Now I'm going to take that and put it into the Keithley so you can see the difference. Right now, this meter is telling us we have 28 millivolts. Well, I'm on DC. Remember that attention to detail thing I was talking about? 13 volts. Point two volts. Eight point eight nine. Okay, and when I put this into my other meter, okay, it says 8.96. It's not too terribly far off. We want 3 volts AC. Okay, so. Since I'm going in the output, in the main in, I have to dial it in from here, and it's not all that easy to do. Okay, here we go. All right, so that's about three volts AC, so now we want to see what the distortion is, which means we need to plug that back into the distortion analyzer. Okay, all right, and you can see here, we have, don't worry about the wattage, we're concerned with the THD. I'm going to set this so that we see uh, just one channel. That makes it a little larger. Distortion looks pretty good. Now this will screw with the offset too, so I'm just going to move this a very little bit either way okay you see the distortions dropping and we went into protection because did I mention this screws with the offset there we go Okay. So I'm going to have to check the offset. I'm going to have to go back and forth and do this a few times. Uh, I'm going to do that off camera. You don't need to hear me curse. Okay, so I went back and forth with this a few times. This is pretty much the best I can get it with reasonable offset and um, lowest distortion. This is supposed to be at 0.03. It's 0.034. This unit is not calibrated. I'm going to call that good. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hook up some speakers to this thing and we're going to see how it sounds. Okay, so I've got this hooked up to some speakers, got some YouTube safe music here. And let's see what this thing sounds like. I can see I can put some stretch marks on the woofers and these little bench speakers with this. But anyhow, it seems to be working pretty well. I'm going to run it through, make sure the tune and everything else works, and I'm going to go give it back to my buddy. 
anyhow, I think that completes this video. Uh, I was really shocked to find two bad trimmers in two consecutive units, but you never know what you're going to find when you open these. You need to keep an open mind. Uh, I initially thought that I had shorted output transistors. That was not the case. We make our diagnosis based on our experience. Sometimes we're right, sometimes we're wrong, but we need a starting point. Um, and with units like this, it, it's helpful that you can break the preamp and power amp and see where your problems lie. So anyhow, I'm going to call it fixed. I'm going to put the covers back on, make sure everything works, and give it back to my friend. And I want to thank everyone for watching this. And as always, I like giving back to the community that's given me so much. Thanks a lot, folks.